The treatment phase of cancer is notorious. Media and Hollywood have seared images of what cancer treatment looks like into our unconscious. Some of it good, some of it misleading, and some of it ugly. So, in this episode of Come On In, AYA Cancer Unfiltered, let's talk about cancer treatment. What it looks like, what happens, and how you'll feel. We'll discuss it all in Treatment, the Treatment Process. So, what really happens during the treatment phase? Hematologist and oncologist Dr. Leonard Sender, founder of the Society for Adolescent and Young Adult Oncology, explains. In the course of treatment, many things can happen. You may have to start off with surgery. In that case, you will have to think about the post-operative changes. How are you healing? Are there drains? How will you take care of them? Is there a catheter in the place for IV medications? How will you take care of that? Those are the kind of things that you'll need to learn about if you have surgery. If you have chemotherapy, there are other things, many of which you probably have heard about. Will there be nausea? Will it be bad? Are there medications that can help mitigate the side effects? Am I going to lose my hair? How soon will that happen? What should I eat? What if I don't feel like eating? Is it going to be difficult to sleep at night? Is it okay for me to exercise? Is it okay for me to be sexually active? These are the questions that your oncologist, your oncology social worker, or your patient navigator should be answering you. Don't be shy about asking for a roadmap that will help you set up expectations for what your treatment phase is going to be like. How your cancer progresses is also important. In cancer treatment, this is referred to as staging. One of the things you're going to hear about is called staging. That means we determine the cancer is just in one spot, the place where it is first detected, or it is moved beyond that one location. There's a special staging system that enables all cancer doctors to talk about cancers they are treating, and all other doctors in other parts of the country or the world will know what they're talking about. There are four stages of cancer that are recognized in the AJCC staging system. The AJCC staging system makes it easy to categorize the different stages of cancer so you can talk to doctors across the country easily and effortlessly. If your cancer is in stage 1, typically it's pretty small and contained in the organ it started in. If your cancer is in stage 2, that usually means the cancer has not started to spread into surrounding tissue, but the tumor is larger than in stage 1. Sometimes cancer cells may also have spread into lymph nodes close to the tumor. Stage 3 usually means that the cancer is larger. It is likely started to spread into surrounding tissues, and there are cancer cells in the lymph nodes surrounding the organ of origin. Stage 4 means that the cancer has spread from where it started to another bodily organ. This also is called secondary or metastatic cancer. If your doctor recommends surgery, make sure you understand why. If you have to have surgery, you can expect to stay in the hospital. Following surgery, there's usually some pain and discomfort. Before having the surgery, please feel free to ask your surgeon about pain management. What kind of medications do they use? How do they approach pain management? Are you going to eat? How long will your hospital stay likely be? What's the dressing going to look like? You can even ask questions like, after surgery, will I look different? What should I expect for the first few days? Will I be able to walk around and exercise? Don't be afraid to ask your surgeons questions. If you do not need to have surgery, there is a good chance your treatment will require chemotherapy. There are more than 80 different types of chemotherapy, and they can be very different from one another. Some fusions can be very short, just under an hour. Some can be as long as 24 hours. Ask your oncologist or the nurse about what you expect. Chemotherapy infusions come in through an IV. It doesn't usually hurt, but it can have other side effects like nausea or headaches. Your oncology team might want to pre-medicate you with different drugs to help you better tolerate the chemo. But all of this should be carefully explained to you when they review the consent form that you will sign before this part of the treatment begins. Make sure that that form also has the name 
or the names of the types of chemotherapy you'll be receiving. This will be very important information for you to know later. As Dr. Sanders said, chemotherapy is usually delivered by an IV. However, it can also be delivered orally or topically depending on the type of chemo. Make sure you know which kind you're getting and why before you start treatment. The last form of commonly used cancer treatment is radiation therapy. This works by directing an intense, focused beam of radiation at your cancer cells in order to eliminate them. Usually the rays are x-rays or photon rays, and they're invisible to the naked eye. Chemotherapy and radiation therapy have side effects you should look out for. Fatigue, nausea, dry mouth, but also called chemo mouth, are common ones. Make sure you tell your doctor if you have any of these, and they may be able to provide medication to help. Of course, losing your hair may be the most dramatic, but this depends on the type of chemo that you receive. Not all chemotherapy results in hair loss. Ask your doctor if you have any questions about losing your hair. You may also have heard of something called chemo brain. Chemo brain is similar to brain fog. Its symptoms are fogginess in the mind, spacing out, memory lapses, or difficulty in processing information and holding conversations. All this may result from chemotherapy or radiation therapy. There are some medications which can be used for chemo brain, but they're not foolproof and don't work for everybody. But make sure to ask your doctor if they have any recommendations. However, cognitive rehabilitation therapy could be a great option if you're looking to improve symptoms. Basically, it works by retraining your brain through puzzles, games, and reading, and has been shown to improve cognitive function. Elevate and Luminosity are popular places to start and are commonly recommended by occupational therapists. They can be accessed by phone or computer, and they both have free versions. If you don't like staring at a screen, you may want to try board games like Sudoku or Scrabble or crossword puzzles, which can also help our brain solve puzzles and reconnect neural pathways. For more information, see the National Cancer Institute's article, What is Chemo Brain? Next? To talk about treatment from a patient and caregiver perspective, we've invited Stephen and Angela Guillaurakis from the organization Elephants in Tea. Welcome back. So what has treatment been like for you? You've been through it a few times, Stephen. Has each time been different? So, you know, um, chemotherapy is the worst thing by far. It's not even a question. Um, chemotherapy would suck. God, I had 10 months of chemotherapy. Um, so I had five different chemos with my first cancer. Um, when I relapsed, they just gave me a medication that I didn't really have many side effects from. Um, but then with the leukemia, I had to have chemo again. But I was in the hospital for 30 days at a time instead of just like five days. Um, I've had a couple different types of radiation. Uh, that first time they gave me, which is basically a big blast of radiation, I never really had that type ever again. And the radiation that I had was this stuff called tomotherapy. Um, and so it's, they shoot pinpoint laser blasts into your spine. And so it's pretty accurate and they minimize the damage. And so I didn't really have much effect from that until the last few weeks, I had five weeks of it. I had some fatigue and I began to have a little bit of sight uh, tenderness, but really it was quite mild in the symptoms. Um, I thankfully had really good surgeons. There was two options with my first surgery that I had, the first big back surgery, and it was do what we did, which was remove my fourth lumbar, take out the tumor, use my spine. Option B, which there really wasn't an option B, but option B was take out everything below L2. So from a treatment standpoint, it worked out really well. Um, and then the weirdest treatment, though, is the bone marrow transplant by far because it either works and it kills you, it doesn't work, or it works, and you live. So after, two, you know, you get it, it's really anticlimactic. You wait for two weeks, you feel fine, and then all of a sudden you get the worst flu in the entire world. At least, at least that's what it feels like. And your cells have begun to grow. And then over the course of the next couple of years, you know, you, you, you come to understand what the relationship you're going to have with your immune system is going to be. Um, because I thankfully have had, like, really nice immune system. It's been, it's kept itself in check. I did go through a part of time where I had graft versus host disease, which is, you know, it's, again, it's that your graft, your bone marrow versus your body. And so I had some acute like rashes and some uh, GI issues. And like in the summertime when it was hot, 
and like I could feel my capillaries open up. It would feel like it would feel like ants crawling all over my skin. You could basically feel your immune cells like hitting your skin. Um, and so that was the weirdest treatment by far. Um, and then this last time around, I had major surgery uh, and proton therapy, which is a different type of radiation. They use protons instead of uh, photons of light. And it gets to impart all the energy in the back. So I had, again, some tenderness with that. But again, being in my lower, in my lower abdomen didn't cause me much issue. And so very lucky. Very, very lucky. Treatment sounds like it can be pretty rough. How do you get through it? You need to have the right medications, whether it's anti-nausea medications. Um, you need to not be afraid to ask for the, the things that you need. If you're having pain, ask for pain medication. Uh, and, you know, it's really that, like trying to be like, I feel like shit. I need something that's going to deal with this. You know, I need to be, and, and as an adult, you know, as a, as a young adult, you know, you might have a job to do. And so you might be getting medication you're taking at home. And so making sure you have the right anti-nausea medication, all of those things to try and deal with those symptoms as best as possible. That's really the main thing after that, you know, doing whatever you can to help your mental, your psyche, whether that's going for walks, whether that's, if you're a reader, read, if you're a writer, write, you know, again, whatever, really whatever makes you feel good, you should do. Um, because anything, anytime you can get that endorphin, that oxytocin, any of those like neurochemicals that really do help, uh, are just an absolute boon, um, you know, and then mindfulness truly, you know, again, it's, it's everywhere, but it's everywhere because it should be everywhere and it works. It will come to an end, you know, at some point. This moment will end, you know, and might, might take a week, but this moment will end. Angela, what was the treatment phase like for you as a caregiver? So um, one of the things um, that I did, besides pray a lot, um, was, first of all, I have a great relationship with Stephen, okay? And um, I knew that you know, he was going to tell me if he needed something, um, particularly when he was 15 as well. Uh, we, my husband and I just alternated being in the hospital with him at all times. Um, not that we didn't trust our physician or the nurses, but we knew that, he, you know, we just needed to be there. I was a college professor at a local university and I just out and out quit. Um, I think maybe I felt bad for one day, frankly, because I knew that the only thing I needed to do and wanted to do was to be there for my son. There was just no question in my mind. Also, we were very fortunate financially that I could do that because not everyone has that, you know, opportunity to be that person. In what ways were you able to support Stephen? Um, my needs were secondary to my son's needs, and I was very comfortable with that. I didn't need a lot of people around me. In fact, I preferred not having people around me because I knew how awful he was feeling. During, during his treatment, he just would wrap himself up in a blanket, cover his head, and just get his meds. In fact, when you asked him about, you know, what did you do when you were getting treatment, one of the things he would do is quite sneaky. Um, when the nurses would walk in the room to talk to him or whatever, he would just pull the blanket over his head and he would pretend that he was sleeping. And I knew that he was doing that, but I didn't say anything. Yeah, pretended. It just, you know, you know, what are you going to ask me? How do you feel? Well, I feel great. You know, I've got doxyrubicin going through my body right now. You know, this kind of a thing. Also, I think, you know, the whole idea of uh, supplemental medication, you know, to deal with the side effects of treatment is so important. And when people express a concern that their child is getting too much pain medicine, I just, you know, I, I always have to refer them to their medical team. But, you know, um, it's all about, you know, having to stay comfortable. And one of the things I really appreciated at my son's hospital at, at, at UH uh, Rainbow uh, was that their goal was to that you would not experience pain um, because the calmer the patient can be, the calmer everything else is, you know. So whether we like it or not, that is the nature of the beast. How did you take care of yourself as a caregiver during Stephen's treatment? I went for walks. I walked. 
that that was the one thing that helped clear my head you know i would also talk with other moms that were going through it as well and i have two good friends that i have stayed friends with since uh that experience one being a person who lost her daughter and the other one whose son was having his bone marrow transplant at the same time as steve um and to this day you know once you've been through something like this it really helps to talk to people who understand what, how you see the world, you know, um, because we know what the worst possible thing is. Can I add one more thing? Because this is something I have to be honest with you. Okay. Yes, I walked. Okay. But I also consumed a lot of wine at night. Okay. That is not the healthiest thing to do, but my one friend, and I'm not going to say which one it was, but there was one night where we had both spent the whole day at the hospital and we ended up in the same wine department of the same grocery store that night. And she was standing there holding not a regular size bottle of wine, but a big one. Okay. And I was standing there and we just kind of looked at each other and said, gee, I think I know what you're going to be doing tonight. You know, yeah, we do go through a lot of stress. And to say that everything's hunky-dory and yes, we all communicate would be not telling the complete truth because it is very stressful. How can family and friends support cancer patients and caregivers during this difficult time? Like most things, people don't know what to do. They don't know what to say um, when you're diagnosed. And I mean, our family, they... Like the immediate family was really good. They were just like, what do you need from us? What do you need? What do you need? Um, especially like my mom's sibling and my dad's siblings. You know, if if, I, if one of them couldn't be there in the morning, they would come and sit with me and wait. So like I was never alone. Uh, but they also respected, for the, like the immediate family really respected like boundaries as well. Yeah, um, yeah. In, in the beginning, you were getting like things sent to the house. Like people like, wouldn't even call and tell you. And you'd come home and there were literally, literally three fruit baskets the one time. <laughs> and I was like, and the, uh, edible arrangements, like, oh, so I hate it now. So much. Well-intentioned. And like from there, we transitioned to having like a dinner schedule. People would make dinner on certain nights. And that helped a lot. Uh, but I would say that most people just wanted to be there. I actually remember coming, coming to school like a week after getting diagnosed. And half the football team had shaved their head. But I hadn't lost my hair yet. <laughs> And I had long curly <laughs> hair. And so they're all like, what the hell? You know, what do you mean you still have hair? Don't you lose hair when you have cancer? I'm like, I don't know. This is not this is my first time doing this too, you know. Um, so it really was this, um, at least in our experience, it was that way where there was this love, there was compassion, but they really didn't try to like be overbearing, at least yeah. I didn't. If there was, people shielded me from it pretty well. You know, the whole communication, you know, you have to communicate. If you don't communicate, you're going to get frustrated. I mean, to me, that is just the bottom line. We talked a little about your magazine, Elephants and Tea, during the second episode of this podcast. You gave us some wonderful insights about the diagnosis phase, but what about now? What does Elephants and Tea offer patients during the treatment phase? Yeah, so we have a couple different things that we do. We do, we have writing workshops where we actually provide um, everybody in the workshop with one a notebook that has curated content that we've done with another organization, uh, the I'm Not Done Yet Foundation. Uh, and there's prompts that are put in there, but then we, during the actual writing workshop, we will have people write and if they want to talk, they, they can. So there's those, those that we do. We have our purgatory events where we actually have some of our writers that we know are good at writing and like writing on certain topics will write on a specific topic and then read their piece to an unrecorded crowd of people. And, and, then, and then, they, then they get to interact and they get to have questions and talk. Um, and those are really well received within the community because we're talking about frank topics, whether it's metastatic cancer, whether it's death, whether it's LGBTQ, I mean, everything, anything you can think of, we talk about. Uh, and so that's how we actively engage um, with our audience beyond just being able to read and not feeling alone. Like that's probably like truly like the biggest thing is that that's the service, yeah. That's the service, that's the service that we provide. That 
people I, realize that they're not alone, that they can read this story and go, holy crap, there are people out there that are like me, that understand this world, understand my frustration, my anger, all of that. Mm-hmm. So it's, we do all of those things, but really that's what it's about. It's that person picking up that magazine or reading an article online and going, I can relate to this. And that's what it's about right there, that idea. Do you have any closing advice to patients or caregivers who are going through the treatment phase? My advice to other people is to not be afraid to ask for help when you need it, whether it's for someone else to be in the hospital with your child if they're younger. If they're older, I tell people to follow their lead, you know, young or old, you know, let them set the stage, you know, what do they need from me? What do they need from you? You know, the parent or the the husband or wife or caregiver. Be selfish. Well, here, here, here's the better, here's the better, the, the better idea is that we're also willing to forgive other people. We should be willing to give ourselves some kindness. And if you're able to give yourself some kindness, then you're able to be like, I feel like shit right now. And it's okay that I feel like shit. It's okay that I feel terrible. I can take my medication. I'm allowed to say, I can't do this today, but I just need to lay in bed all day today. You know, it really is about, you know, being selfish in the sense of like, you know, really putting yourself first because, you know, the whole saying, you can't have anybody else if you don't take care of yourself. And it's the truth. You can't be productive in life if you don't take care of yourself. And that really starts with being kind to yourself. Thank you. In addition to the side effects we talked about earlier, there are also many food-related symptoms that are associated with cancer treatment. Here to share knowledge about diet and lifestyle changes during treatment, please welcome back Jocelyn Harrison, a registered dietitian and founder of Pacific Nutrition Partners. Jocelyn, what are the common diet and exercise issues AYA patients face when going through infusions or radiation therapy? Treatment can include radiation, it can include surgery, it can include chemotherapy. And all three of those have different side effects that might impact you. For instance, uh, chemotherapy in particular, someone who is receiving chemotherapy could, you know, lose their appetite, uh, feel nauseous a lot, et cetera. And there are a host of things. They might uh, lose their sense of taste and smell. They might have a really dry mouth. That might happen with radiation as well. Um, And what you want to do is just be aware of how your intake of good nutrition is being affected and reach out to your healthcare team. And if you're working with a registered dietitian uh, and let them know, because there are things that all of us in your healthcare team can do to make sure you are getting adequate nutrition. It's really, really important. You need that nutrition um, to stay strong, to have stamina, and also to give your body all the nutrients it needs in order to carry you through the process. How can diet and exercise goals change when you're going through treatment? Are there any foods you should eat more or less often? Well, during treatment, it really, once again, you're, you might get tired of me saying this, but it's so unique to your specific situation. There's no one food that you should eat more of or eat less of. And I'll give you an example. If someone is going through a course of chemotherapy and they are just have no appetite, nothing seems appealing to them and they're losing weight, then the prescription for that person might be eat ice cream, find that thing that you enjoy just so that you're getting some nutrients in. And that doesn't seem like the healthiest thing, but for that person, that might be the healthiest thing. How about exercise? Should people be exercising during treatment? Uh, In terms of physical activity, again, it's just going to depend on how you feel in the process. Um, Studies have shown us that people who are going through cancer treatment often improve with physical activity, that physical activity makes their journey easier and more manageable and helps keep their stamina up, et cetera. So if you can do physical activity, 
nothing is stopping you and you have the energy to do it, then by all means do that. Physical activity is also very fundamental to your health. And by optimizing your diet and by incorporating physical activity, both can actually prevent a recurrence, which is something that you most likely will be focused on in this phase. Thank you. To end this episode, we asked our guests Angela and Stephen Gialarakis to answer this question. What is the lifestyle thing that's most important during the treatment phase? Mental health medication. That is by far the biggest thing in the world. Everybody wants to self-medicate with booze, weed, whatever. And I'm and I smoke marijuana. I'm, and I'm not going to sit there and say I don't, but I do. Um, but if you're willing to do that to your brain and your body, you should be willing to take the medication that's been peer reviewed and researched. Um, <laughs> and and ever since being on antidepressants and anti anxiety medication, I have really like been able to handle life a lot better. It's okay to say I need help. And it might not be medication. It might be mindfulness. It might be cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, But really, you know, since being honest with the mental health issues that I have, um, it has made everything else in life so much better. Yeah, I, I would agree with Steve, you know, that looking out for your mental health is really important. Get whatever Um, On a personal level, I think when I started studying meditation, you know, I could make the connection from my personal experience as a counselor, but also as a religious person and as a spiritual person who would spend time in prayer and things like that. It's a really beautiful thing to do for yourself. And it helped me understand myself and my motivations behind the things that I've done over the last, you know, since Stephen's cancers and its impact on our family, on me personally, and getting a handle on life. And that concludes our time together. Thank you for joining us. The links to Elevate and Luminosity, the cognitive rehabilitation programs that can help with chemo brain, are in the description box below, in case you want to check them out. Next time, we revisit on co-fertility and talk about sex during treatment. Stay tuned for Treatment on co-fertility and sexual health for more information. Hey, take a second to sit back, relax, and take a well-deserved break with a fun puzzle or maybe try out some of those word games. See you next time. This has been Come On In, AYA Cancer Unfiltered, a podcast for patients 15 to 39. This podcast was produced by Reimagine Well with funding by 70K. Our creative producer is Emma Grace Eisenman with video production by Sedona Cruz. Our creative director is Roger Holzberg. Our content supervisor is Adele Sender. Our project manager and coordinator is Pamela Primesa Carstens. Our social media manager is Sedona Cruz. Our social media intern is Ryan Meglino. Script by Emma Grace Eisenman, based on the Adolescence and Young Adult Cancer and Oncofertility Guides by Reimagine Well. Audio editing by Emma Grace Eisenman. Video editing by Sedona Cruz. Additional audio and video editing by Graham Carstens. Digital artwork by Ray Jameson. Graphic design by Sarah Gray. A big thank you to our medical experts, Dr. Leonard Sender, Dr. Lakshmi Kondapali, Jocelyn Harrison, RDN, Ginny Urikel, MSW, and Debbie Wagers, CCLS. Our guests for this episode were Johnny Immerman of Close Talk and founder of Immerman Angels, Mallory Casperson, MS, co-founder and CEO of Cactus Cancer Society, Lauren Creel, MSW, MPH Chief Operations Officer of Cactus Cancer Society. David Craig, CEO of Grit Health. And Lauren Lestauskas, Vice President of Community at Grit Health. Stephen Gialarakis, President of the Stephen G. Cancer Foundation. Angela Gialarakis, PhD, Founder of the Stephen G. Cancer Foundation. And Blake Dirksen. Thank you. This podcast is possible because of you.